Hey everyone, it's Cal from Wise Guys Tutoring. Uh, here's another video on that uh, MSAT Math 2022 sample test that's found online. So we'll be doing questions uh, 26 to 30, it's just another five questions. Um, I'll remind you that I also offer private and group lessons for the MSAT. You can hit me up on Instagram at wiseguysuae or by email info at wiseguysuae.com and uh, we can set something up. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started. Question 26 says, find the derivative of f of x ln of 2x plus 1. Um, so the derivative for any ln function, so ln, for example, ln of x, if I want the derivative, that's what this notation means, the derivative of ln of x is 1 over x. So you take whatever is in your ln and you, do, you invert it, you say 1 over, okay? But here's the thing. What we have inside here is not just x, it's 2x plus 1. And I've told you guys before in a previous video, which I'll link up there, is that you need to apply the chain rule. And this is the way the chain rule works. So if I have ln of 2x plus 1, and I'm trying to find the derivative of this, then I'll use the following rule, right? I invert whatever I got there inside. But then I also have to multiply by the derivative of the inside. That's the chain rule. You got to multiply by the derivative of the inside. Derivative of 2x plus 1 is simply 2. And so the derivative of this whole thing becomes 2 over 2x plus 1, which was the fourth one. Um, another area where the where the chain rule, since we're talking about it, I want to give you guys a you know holistic understanding. If you have something like this, for example, 2x plus 1 cubed okay and you're trying to find the derivative of this well first we apply the power rule which says that you got to bring down the exponent and decrease it by one so this becomes three two x plus one squared and that's well and good except look at the inside of what we had in the power rule i got to multiply by the derivative of the inside so again i'm going to be multiplying by two so this ends up being 6, 2x plus 1 squared. So this is how you apply the chain rule along with the power rule. Another, another setting where you might see this is when you have e to the power of 2x plus 1. If I want the derivative of this bad boy. So you would say the derivative of any e function is the same. It doesn't change, right? But again, using the chain rule, I need to find the derivative, multiply the derivative of the exponent itself. So again, here I would multiply by 2. Now I'm giving you guys a pretty simple example with the 2x plus 1. But this really could be, could be anything inside your, your power, power rule bracket or inside your lawn or inside the, as an exponent of your e. Whatever it is, you just have to multiply by the derivative. Uh, here's a fourth situation. Let's say I had a trig function sine of 2x plus 1. So if I want the derivative of this, then the derivative of sine of an angle is cosine of that angle. However, since my angle is a function of x, right, I got to find and multiply by the derivative of the inside of my angle. So I have to multiply by 2 again. So that's the chain rule uh, as it relates to trig functions. So there you go. Okay, um, so this this called the chain rule, and you really got to be careful when you're doing derivatives. Always ask yourself, have I multiplied by the derivative of the inside? Now, in this first case, you might say, how come we derive, you know, we multiply by the derivative of the inside in these bottom four cases, but we didn't do it for the top? Well, technically you did, right? You inverted what we had inside the lawn, and then what's the derivative of x? Derivative of x is just 1. So it doesn't change anything. When it's just x, you, you technically are multiplying by the derivative. You're still applying the same rule, but the derivative is 1. And, and as you know, there's no need to multiply by 1. It doesn't change anything. All right. So I hope uh, that gives you a good understanding of the chain rule. Uh, let's move on to the next question. This one says, for the given polar equation shown below, write an equivalent Cartesian equation. Um, so we, we're very used to, I've put this circle, obviously, this is not from the IMSAT. Uh, we are used to the Cartesian plane, which is X and Y coordinates, where X is the horizontal, you know, left and right, and Y is the vertical, up and down. 
uh, but that's not the only coordinate system that exists there also exists polar coordinates and polar coordinates are a little bit different in that they work using a distance and an angle so if you can picture for example an object which is located just over here right I can use two ways to describe this this location right I can say for example X is at 2 and Y is at 3 for example right and then you would say the coordinates of this point are 2 and 3 okay now another way I can describe the, the position of this point is by using polar coordinates and the way that works is I have to give you the distance of this point for example it might be at a distance of four meters or kilometers or whatever it is four units but I would also have to give you the angle the angle where it's at so if I gave you the angle then you would know that it's along this line and if I give you the distance then you would know how far along that line it is now this is an important point to give you the coordinates using polar coordinates I need to give you both I can't just give you the distance and I can't just give you the the angle right if I only gave you this angle you wouldn't know along this line where along this line I am and if I only told you it's four well it could be four here could be four here could be four here could be four here so you need both the angle and the distance and that's what we're gonna see right now let me clean this up a little bit and we'll bring R all the way to the to the circle just so you know it could look a little bit clearer uh, and we're gonna call it R so let's just continue that line uh, and instead of four we'll just call it R could be four could be more could be less etc okay so when you look at this point here on the circle we can tell that using trigonometry its x coordinate is just over here and its y coordinate is at this height here now using the fact that this is a right angle triangle of course we can decide that sine theta let's make it green sine theta as you remember from Sokotoa is opposite which is the y coordinate over the radius which is the hypotenuse in this case okay now if I multiply both sides by r what you find is that sine theta r sine theta equals y and I can do the same for cosine theta cosine theta would be adjacent which is this x coordinate over hypotenuse which is r if I do the same algebra here to simplify I'll find that r cos theta equals x and those are your two main conversions between polar coordinates which only use r and theta and rectangular coordinates which only use x and y now there is one more which uses Pythagoras and Pythagoras says that a squared which is one of the legs plus b squared which is the other leg is equal to c squared which is the hypotenuse so that's your fourth equation your fourth equation is r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared r squared of course being the polar and x and y being the rectangular or Cartesian coordinates so using these three you can jump around between one form and the other for here we have 9 r cos theta and as we saw r cos theta just means x when we're talking about the Cartesian uh, coordinates and r sine theta just means y and we've seen y it's just basic trigonometry so if this is n 9x plus 2y equals 1 then the answer is going to be this one okay right here you can see that it's pretty close it's 9x plus 2y but that's equal to r that's not equal to 1 okay if they said equal to r then that would have been the answer um, and this one is not correct because y and x are inverted r cos theta as we've seen is the x coordinate not the y coordinate and vice versa all right uh, that's pretty much it let's move on to the next one here we're told if x equals 4 and y equals 1 evaluate 2x minus 3xy this is just a classic case of substitution 
that means wherever my eyes see the variable x, I'm going to instead put the number 4. And wherever my eyes see y, I'm going to instead put the number 1. And we'll do the calculation. So this is actually equal to 2 times 4 minus 3 times 4 times 1. 2 times 4 is 8 minus 3 times 4 times 1 is 12. So 8 minus 12 I'm left with negative 4, and that means the answer is negative 4. All right, that one is pretty straightforward, um, so I guess we'll just move on. Okay, folks, so we went from a simple substitution to calculus integration. So this one says, find the integral of 3x squared plus 2x minus 1 uh, dx with respect to x. So the good news here is that when you have the integral of a polynomial like this, it's actually the same thing as finding the integral of each one separately. Notice I'm going to put a minus here because it was minus 1, um, which makes it a lot easier. And when you have uh, you know, monomials like this, which is just the power of x, then we're going to have to use the integral power rule, which is a little bit different than the derivative power rule. I'll remind you of both. Okay, For the derivative, if I had x to the n, and I'm trying to find the derivative of this, then what you do is bring down your power and then decrease it by 1, right? This is for finding derivatives using the power rule. For the integral, for the integral, you got to go the other way around. What happens is this. You increase your power by 1. You don't decrease. You increase your power by 1. And instead of multiplying, you divide by your new exponent, Okay, you always have to add the integration constant c. So, why does this work? Let's see. If I gave you an example, x cubed dx, what you'd have to do is add 1 to your exponent and then divide by your new exponent. That means your integral is x to the 4 over 4 plus c. And we can check this quite easily because as you know the integral is the antiderivative. That means if I took the derivative of my answer I should get back my integrand, the thing that's inside the integral. So let's do a quick quick check. If I use this power rule for the derivative what would I do? I would have to bring down my exponent and I would have to decrease my power by 1 these fours cancel out and I get x cubed which is exactly what I was meant to get. So this is how you check if you got your integral correct. You take the derivative and it should give you back what you had uh, in the integrand. Okay so this is how we apply the the power rule for integration. So let me go over here down here we'll use orange we'll do each one of these guys. So what's the integrand of 3x squared? I'm just going to use the same power rule over here for integrals. I'm going to keep the 3 waiting on the side. My x squared, I'm going to increase his power. So 2 plus 1 becomes 3. And I divide by that same, same new exponent. The second one, I'll make the 2 wait outside. Now the x right now has a power of 1. Right? When you don't see the power, that means the power is 1. What you do is you increase it by 1, so it becomes 2, and you divide by that new exponent. So there you go. Last one, I'll say minus. And the integral of any constant, we can make that constant weight outside, is just x. Okay? If you really want to think about it as a power rule, you can kind of imagine that there is an, that there is an x to the 0. So then when you do the integral, you increase it by 1, right? And you divide by that new exponent, so you end up getting x. But it's probably easier to just remember that the integral of a constant is x, okay? Um, let's see now. We're missing the integration constant c. Whenever you integrate, you have to use the constant c, and I'll explain to you why we use that. So here we can start to simplify. As you can see, the 3 will cancel out with the 3 because when you're multiplying and dividing, they undo each other. Same thing happens with the 2, so that's pretty lucky. So x squared. And here we have minus 1 times x, which is just minus x. Here it is. Plus c, of course. 
which means the correct answer is that second one. Okay. Uh, about C, so when you integrate something, let's take this, this straightforward uh, example of x cubed, right? x cubed gave you x to the 4 uh, over 4 plus C. And you saw that the way that we check is by taking the derivative, right? And the derivative should give you back your integrand in here. So what if instead of x to the 4 over 4, maybe it was x to the 4 over 4 plus 5. Now when I take the derivative of this, as you know, we know the derivative of this, we just checked it, it's x cubed, and the derivative of the 5 is just 0. So then this would be a correct answer to this integral, right? Because when I take the derivative of it, I get x cubed back. Now I could also have said it's x to the 4 plus 107 or 106. If I took the derivative of this, well, wouldn't you know it, I get the exact same thing, wouldn't I? And if I took x to the 4 over 4 plus 100,023, 231, whatever, guess what? I would still get x cubed. So the integral of x cubed can be any one of these, right? The constant can change. We have no way of knowing unless they give us another pre-existing condition. That's why whenever you take these indefinite integral that don't have limits, you always have to include the integration constant c because either one of these, there's an infinite number of, of integrals to x cubed. We have no way of knowing because the constant disappears when you check, right? So you have to put c, okay? Um, you don't really have to know where that comes from. Just remember when you're doing indefinite integrals, you always have to include the integration constant c, all right? Let's do the last question. Okay, this question says, let a equals minus 3 plus 5i, b equals 4 minus 2i, and c equals 1 plus 6i, where i is the imaginary unit. What does a minus bc equal? Uh, I'll just remind you what i is, right? i squared is equal to minus 1, which is, you know, useful for us because then we know that i is the square root of minus 1, right? We were always taught that you can't take the square root of a negative number. But i allows us to do that, which helps a lot of, you know, different kinds of calculations. Um, so for us, we're going to do a minus bc. So obviously, operations, uh, order of operations dictates that we do b times c first. So this is how we're going to multiply them. b is 4 minus 2i. And c is 1 plus 6i. So we're just going to do the foiling like we always do, right? We go 1, 2, 3, 4. And you'll see what happens when we multiply those i's together. So 4 times 1 is 4. 4 times 6i is just 24i. Minus 2i times 1 is minus 2i. And here's where it gets interesting. Minus 2i, <coughs> excuse me, times 6i is minus 12i squared. Now remember, i squared is equal to minus 1. So this will become 4 plus 24i minus 2i minus 12 times negative 1. This will turn into a positive. So it becomes 4 plus 12, which is 16. And 24i minus 2i, as I always say, it's like 24 apples minus 2 apples. Anything you have, if you're adding and subtracting, if you have 24 of something and you remove 2 of it, you now have 22 of it, whatever it is. Okay, so that's part BC. But of course, we have A minus BC. So let's go over here. A was minus 3 plus 5i. And if you're subtracting BC, which is 16 plus 22i, what you're going to do, let's get rid of the brackets first. So this is like minus 16 minus 22i. When you're doing addition and subtraction of these complex numbers, which is part real and part imaginary, I'll put a link up here because we've done this before. So you get minus 3 minus 16. Those are the like terms, which becomes minus 19. And you have 5i minus 22i, which is minus 17i, which would mean the correct answer is that first one. Um, that's it for this video. Hope you found it helpful. If you have any comments or suggestions or questions, please leave them for me below. As usual, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel because I'm going to be dropping a lot of MSAT videos soon. And uh, again, if you need any private uh, or group lessons, just hit me up on Instagram at wiseguysuae. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks again.